to start by thanking you all for coming out tonight to hear this presentation. Uh, this is sponsored by Granite State Priorities. I am a member of the board, have been for a number of years. It, it was at one time known as the Granite State Fair Tax Coalition. It is an organization that is dedicated to a New Hampshire where revenue is adequate to the needs of the state and the, and the way of raising that revenue is fair to the citizens of the state. And that being said, I'll get right into the presentation. I think oftentimes in politics, we get focused on the immediate. How do we get through this legislative cycle? How do we get through this budget? And we don't take the time to think about the bigger picture, which to me would be, what kind of state do we want to be? And what kind of state are we? How do we measure up against what we want to be? And I think a lot of people hearing those questions would think, oh, that's, that's much too big uh, an issue for me to take on. You know, where would we start? And my response is, it isn't as hard as you think because someone's really done most of the work. And those people are the people who wrote our Constitution in 1784. They were starting pretty much from scratch and they had overthrown the old world and the old system and they were asking the big questions. What kind of state do we want to be? So when they wrote our Constitution, they wrote values into that document. And I recommend to all of you, if you've never done it, to read the Bill of Rights of the New Hampshire Constitution. I bet it would take you no more than five minutes. And it's very easy to do, nh.gov, and then on the left side of the home screen of the state, click on Constitution and read. And it's 25 or 30 paragraphs long, but most of the paragraphs are one sentence. And you'll see the 18th century language, but you'll see they really thought hard about what kind of state do we want to be. And some of what's there isn't so much nuts and bolts about how many legislators and how many branches of government. It's about what kind of state we want to be. When I think back on our history of New Hampshire and those people who wrote the Constitution, to me, they were people who were forward-looking, they were thinking about the future, and they knew the future could be better than the present they were living in. And they knew that because they had the ability to look backwards and see where the state had come from. And they, either themselves, or their parents or their grandparents had gone into the wilderness and cleared the land and created farms and pastures. They had built sawmills and grist mills. They had seen the progress just within their lifetimes and the lifetimes of their parents. And they said, we're going to continue that. And so they thought about the future when they wrote our Constitution. So now I want to bring to your attention three values from our Constitution, which I really think could be the mission statement for New Hampshire, or a good part of it. So this is the very first sentence of our Constitution. And the part I bring to your attention is the very end. That government is created for the general good. We always have to keep that in mind, because some people seem to forget it, that government, the best government is, or the legislature exists to, to cut government. You know, that's why we, we put the legislature in office, it's to try to get rid of laws and taxes, and, um, and it's all about each individual's bottom line instead of the common good. This one I love, and it's not many people know about it. Every member of the community has a right to be protected by it in the enjoyment of his life, liberty, and property. He is therefore bound to contribute his share in the expense of such protection and to yield his personal service when necessary. The third part, you probably have seen before, it is our education clause. This is where they're looking to the future. And I am substantially shortening this really big, long, run-on sentence with the ellipses. But I haven't cut out any words or added any. Knowledge and learning being essential to the preservation of a free government it shall be the duty of the legislators to cherish the public schools. All right, so I guess I already covered that point. 
New Hampshire, the people who founded New Hampshire were looking towards a better tomorrow. Education was one way. But I also tried to think of other ways where we spend money today, not because it's benefiting us this minute, but it's benefiting us in the future as well. Education is obvious. You could say there's some immediate benefit, but most of the money we're spending on education, we're expecting that return 10 or 20 or 40 or 50 years down the road. Roads, again, we build a road, it's going to last a long time. It's going to have benefits way down the road. No pun intended. And then environmental protection. Again, the, the time and the effort we spend today to clean up our environment or to protect it has benefits way down the road. And I think there are other areas in the state government that have that future component. You can make an argument that money we spend on health care today makes us healthier tomorrow. And so it's not just meeting an immediate need, but it is an investment in the future. Um, you could say the same thing about some of our services. Uh, for, uh, for example, children in need of services. You know, it, again, it's an immediate need, and yet you're working towards the future. But these three I picked out, I think, are the most obvious future-oriented parts of our state budget. Now, before we talk about where we get the money for those future-oriented things, uh, or, or how much we spend on those future-oriented things, we should talk about where the money comes from. Some of you have seen my chart before. <laughs> this is where revenue in New Hampshire comes from. This is state and local tax revenue of all stripes. And the myth that New Hampshire is run on sin taxes, and aren't we so very smart because the outer staters are paying our bills, uh, is demolished by this chart. Sweepstakes is the very smallest item on the chart. And the liquor stores and wine and beer are in the middle, but dwarfed by the property tax, which is well over $3 billion. All of the numbers I'm going to show you are through the 2012 uh, fiscal year. Um, I didn't have time to update these all. I presented these in the fall before the 13 numbers were available. This is how the tax burden is in New Hampshire is distributed. This chart was created by the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy in Washington, D.C. They have done a study of the tax systems of all 50 states. They have done it, I think, three times since the mid-90s. And what you can see on this chart is that the lowest 20% of the population pays state and local taxes at a rate four times that of the top one percent. It's as if we enacted an income tax in New Hampshire and we said the rich are going to pay two percent, the middle's going to pay six, and the poor are going to pay eight. No one would vote for such a tax, but that is effectively what we have in New Hampshire. And I should point out that for statistical reasons, when they created this chart, they did not consider the tax burdens of anybody over the age of 65. We, who are, of course, the people who are paying the largest percentage of their income in tax because they're paying big property tax bills on retirement income. So if we had the retirees in the data, this chart would look a lot worse than it does. New Hampshire has a structural def deficit. You may have heard that term before. Let me try to explain it. And what it means is that our tax revenue, if we make no changes in our taxes on the books, the tax revenue does not grow as fast as the economy. It grows more slowly. And, and the reason for that is because we tax at the state level narrow parts of our economy. We tax restaurant meals and hotel rooms. We tax telephone bills. We tax uh, business profits and so forth. And because we're just taxing a narrow piece, the economy may grow, but that doesn't mean the tourism industry grew at the same rate. Doesn't mean people smoked that many more cigarettes or drank that much more beer. And, and if you think about the long term, people drink less than they did 25 years ago. They smoke less than they did 25 years ago. And even though our population has doubled in the last 40 or so years, I'm not sure, but I doubt that our tourism industry has doubled 
in the same way that the population has, which means those pieces that were holding up parts of the state budget 40 or 50 years ago can't support the same part of the budget they could before because we got twice as many people and twice as many needs. This nifty chart comes to us from the um, Center for Public Policy Studies here in Concord. And what this shows is in, in the bottom part, if starting in 1988, we had not enacted any new taxes and we had not raised any existing tax, where our revenue would have gone. And then we've got the, the lighter colored stripe, which indicates increased rates on existing taxes as of 1988, and then we have the, is that light blue, um, new taxes, and then the Medicaid enhancement, also known as Metascam, is the top stripe. This chart shows general fund tax revenues adjusted for inflation, and we also have population shown. So if we're looking over 25 years, the general fund tax revenue has kept pace, actually grown a little faster than the population. So that's not altogether bad. However, I would point out, if you look at 1999 or, or even 2001, which are the points in the middle of the jagged of the dotted line, you can see that in the last dozen years, general fund revenue adjusted for inflation has gone down in New Hampshire. And during that same, same time period, our population has gone up about 10%. So we have fallen relative to 1999 or 2001, about 15% behind in general fund tax revenue. And you might ask, why did it go up so smartly from 1992 to 1999, and that's primarily the business enterprise tax, which was enacted in the early 90s, and there was a large increase in employment in New Hampshire during the Clinton administration, and, and the revenue followed. I've added to this, the previous chart, personal income adjusted for inflation, and so you can see how tax revenue kind of followed personal income from 88 to 2001, and then they diverged. And to the, where, again, in these last dozen years, general fund revenue has been trending down, personal income has gone up, and we've got a very significant gap now. And I think this is where I want to stop and give some political explanation. <coughs> the traditional pledge in New Hampshire was no broad-based taxes. But that didn't extend to all the other taxes. And so if I go back to that chart, part of the importance of this chart is that we did, over the years since 1988, enact some new taxes, the business enterprise tax being the biggest. Um, we also increased the rates of some existing taxes. And it's happened multiple times. The, the room and meals tax has been increased. The telecommunications tax has been increased. Actually, the business enterprise tax and the business profits tax have been increased. The cigarette tax multiple times. Almost every single one of those tax increases or new taxes was either enacted by Republicans in House, Senate, and Governor's office, or at least one or two of those three bodies or people were Republicans, which is to say Republicans understood we had a structural deficit, and for the period from 88 until 2002, Republicans routinely voted for tweaking this and tweaking that so that the revenue would keep up. We would adjust for the structural deficit and increase something so we would get a few more dollars so that we could just maintain what we put together, not fund anything new. This was just maintaining. 2002 was about the time in New Hampshire and nationally when Republicans shifted from a no broad-based tax to 
no new tax of any type at any time for any reason and no increased taxes of any type for any reason at any time. Which meant the structural deficit is something that we have been feeling from year from year from year to year. And looking at one year again, if you're looking short term, not such a big deal. Maybe uh, the income of the state goes up four percent, and our tax revenue goes up three and a half percent. And oh well, we can live with a half a percent. But when you lay that year on top of year on top of year, and then after a dozen or more years, you've got a big gap compared to where you were. And that is the difficulty that we've been experiencing in New Hampshire in the last dozen or so years. And I did want to mention, 2002 was the year I came in second. <laughs> and the guy who came in first is the one who really pushed onto the Republican Party this idea, we're not for any tax increase of any type anywhere at any time. And they've pretty much held to it uh, since then, and that's part of our problem. Uh, so then you might ask, well, so then how did we compensate when we ran 15% high in revenue over, uh, we fell 15% behind in revenue since 1999? And there are two answers. Uh, we've caught a lot of things. Uh, and you're going to see some more charts in a minute, but we all know the O'Brien budget from a few years ago, the devastating cuts that were put in place then. But there have been other cuts along the way. Um, I had a conversation from, with someone a number of years ago, maybe a half dozen years ago, who works in the developmental disabilities field. And he had been in that field for a long time, and he said, can you imagine having an organization where you get set up and you have you know, a mission, you have a territory in the, in the state, you have a staff, you have an office and, and an infrastructure, and then four years in, the legislature says, you need to restructure, you need to retrench. And so you downsize to a smaller office space, you lay off some administrative staff, you make do, and then you get settled into your straightened circumstances and then the legislature four years later says you need to retrench again and it happens every four to six years for them and it has over the last 20 years the same thing with mental health that they have been squeezed and downsized and squished time and time again and it hasn't been just the o'brien budget that did that to them uh, the other place where we've compensated is with the property tax we have found ways to downshift from the state to the property tax uh, a lot of the state's needs and the state's spending. So the biggest item, I think, and we do have Sue Almi here from Ways and Means, so she can jump up and correct me when I get off the rails, but I think the biggest uh, area has been in the retirement system that um, where the state used to pay a substantial part of uh, the funding of the retirement system for municipal workers and for school districts has gone away entirely. Um, there have also been reductions in the profit sharing, revenue sharing from um, a couple of the state taxes, the business profits tax and the room and meals tax. And the, the way the state pays its share of Medicaid for elderly and nursing homes has been changed so that the counties and the county tax has had to pick up the slack. And school building aid was completely eliminated. And so all of those things have added up and landed on the property tax. The property tax since 1999 in New Hampshire has more than doubled. How many people in this room have seen their income double since 1999? <laughs> there are certainly people in New Hampshire have seen their income double. But they don't pay any more tax necessarily because their income doubled. That's not the system we have. But a lot of people have seen their property taxes double in the last dozen years. Uh, this chart, when I say double, I mean in just raw dollars. This chart is inflation adjusted. And so in 1999, the property tax bill was a billion five hundred eighty-eight million, And then tax adjusted for inflation uh, in 2012, it was two billion three hundred and forty million, so about a fifty percent increase after adjusting for inflation. Population only grew ten percent, so you can see 
the big gap there, how much we had to hit the property tax uh, because of actions by the legislature. Now I'm getting into our spending on those future parts of the budget. This is a chart showing gas tax revenue, uh, a very short primer for people on the state budget. Uh, in a sense, we have three state budgets. We have a highway fund, an education fund, and the general fund. Uh, the general fund funds everything except highways and education, so it funds uh, the judicial system and Medicaid and mental health and disabilities and so forth. Um, the gas tax has not been increased since 1991, and so you can see, in adjusted for inflation, uh, it's been going down steadily since 1999. And yet the number of miles of road in New Hampshire goes up each year. Uh, we have less and less money to pay for it. Uh, we do also have in the highway fund revenue from the registration fees on your cars. So that revenue has gone up, but not anywhere near enough to compensate for the steady drop in the gas tax. Um, and I did try, in case you're interested, to figure out well, what do we pay on for road construction? Could I figure out the road construction budget? But there are so many zigs and zags there. It wasn't um, usable data. The stimulus resulted in a whole lot of federal money that went into road paving, and so that wasn't our money, if you will. It was Washington's money. And there have also been some games where the legislature voted to sell a few miles of, I think, Interstate 95 from the state to the Turnpike Authority, so that then Turnpike money, because toll revenue has been coming in at a steady clip, and transfer it over to the highway fund, and we've been sort of living off of that little one-time shift for a few years. These are a couple charts from the Department of Transportation, and I'm sorry that it didn't copy very well, but you can't see the line, but you can see the numbers, that uh, the miles of pavement in good or fair condition was 3,007 back in 1996. And then you can see about 2,000. You see, that's always sort of around 2,000, 2,002. What happened that year? Who got elected? Anyhow, um, <laughs> the numbers start going down. And so in 2012, we'd gotten down to 2,597 uh, miles of uh, road in New Hampshire out of approximately 4,500 that were in good or fair condition. And then they have a couple projections that they made at that time. Um, and I'm trying to remember the proposed budget and anyhow. I, I think we're on the downward course in 2013, not on the level course. Um, and of course, if you've driven the roads recently, uh, it may be a steeper decline on the, the number of roads in good condition. And this is a chart showing the number of miles of road resurfaced in a year. You can see the effect of the stimulus fund, uh, st stimulus spending. And I, I laugh every time I hear somebody say, where were all those shovel-ready projects? We found them in New Hampshire. We put that money to work, no problem. Must have been other states that weren't on the ball. Um, but again, other than the stimulus, you can see the downward trend. It looks like the peak was in 1996. And I read somewhere that now the state, on average, is repaving roads every 12 years. And the higher traffic roads, like the interstates and 101, are being paved more often than that, which means we have some roads that are being paved every 15, 18 years. And, and I think they should have a new chart. Uh, I was out bike riding in, um, I think it was Charlestown, heading up the Connecticut River on 12A, and noticing the amount of grass that was growing in the road, in the cracks. And I think we should have a chart that's number of miles of road in New Hampshire with grass growing in them. This is university funding. University system of New Hampshire. Again, adjusted for inflation. Uh, and uh, obviously the steep drop at the end is the O'Brien budget. But even 
before the O'Brien budget, you can see that the spending was not keeping pace with inflation. The state was growing, our student body was growing, but our spending for higher education was not keeping pace. And the latest budget has done something to reverse that course, but we are far, far away from where we would be if we had kept pace with inflation. I believe we're at about 50% of where we should be considering what we were spending in 1988 and the population growth in, in the intervening 25 years. This is the education fund spending for K through 12, uh, the adequacy spending, and again, adjusted for inflation, a steady downward trend. Uh, there was a, a significant bump up uh, in the I can't remember now, it's the 11, 12, or 12, 13, I get my years mixed up. Um, I guess that must be, well anyhow, there was a bump up in the budget before O'Brien. Um, and then, but even with that bump in dollars, once you adjust it for inflation, we're below where we started in 2000. Which again, of course, means the property tax has to pick up the slack because the state's contribution to public education has not kept pace with inflation. I thought it would be interesting to put these two lines together. We have the general fund tax revenue adjusted for inflation, and then the property tax. And as I mentioned before, since 1999, the general tax, general fund tax revenue has trended downward somewhat, even as the population has grown by 10%. And then, of course, the, pop, the, the property tax bill adjusted for inflation has gone up 50%. So we are getting more and more of our tax revenue from property tax. We are now over two-thirds property tax in New Hampshire when you look at all state and local revenue. And then I just added gas tax for last, just to, so you could see that downward trend. And that is the end of the slideshow, and I want to go back to whoop, there. Because I think after you've seen all these slides, you, well, you're not feeling very optimistic. And you're also wondering, well, what can we do? And I think the answer would be, would be well, we need more revenue in New Hampshire because it is obvious revenue is declining and we have seen the effects of the decline, whether it's on the roads we drive on or in the services that have been cut, uh, the fact that our in-state tuition for the university system is the highest in the nation, that our students graduate with the highest student debt in the nation. I talked with someone the other day who said um, that when his son got out of college, he said to his son, We've got a big piece of land. We'll subdivide it. You can build a house here. Come live in New Hampshire. And he said, I can't afford to live in New Hampshire because the property taxes are so high. When I'm starting out and I'm expecting my income to fluctuate, I can't be in that position where my income goes down and my property tax is $9,000 a year and how am I going to pay? So he lives in Colorado. And between, uh, and the other thing I heard from the same person, he said, in many cases, out-of-state tuition in another state is less than in-state tuition in New Hampshire. So our students go out of state to study and then they don't come back. And so the way we think about the future, the way we fund higher ed in, this New, Hamp in New Hampshire, has a huge impact on our future. We're living in the future now that we were funding 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. Are we going to change course is really the question. We need more revenue for higher education. We need more revenue from many parts of the state budget. Then the question is, well, where do you get it? And I think part of the answer should be, well, if we're going to get more revenue, we should do something about this chart at the same time. And there are two ways you can think about this. One way is sort of the old New Hampshire nickel and dime, put a Band-Aid on it approach although it should not necessarily be overlooked. Uh, there are two tax ideas which the legislature, the House, I should say, considered strongly in, 
I believe it was 2007, but it might have been 2009, and they were a capital gains tax and, and bringing back the estate tax. We had an estate tax until 2003, and it doesn't take a genius to know that either one of those taxes would affect the people at the far right-hand end of this chart and leave most of the rest of the chart untouched. So that would be a way to get some revenue into the general fund and not ask the middle class to pay. It would not bring in a lot of money uh, relative to the need. Um, I'm going to throw out 50 million as a possibility. It may not be that high. Um, it's an idea. I think that the other old New Hampshire way of dealing with this, which is we'll go back to all the taxes we have and see if we can nudge the, the level up a little bit, is harder to do than maybe it was before. Our restaurant tax is one of the highest in the nation. Our telecommunications tax is one of the highest. Our real estate transfer tax is one of the highest. Our business enterprise tax is pretty much unique to us, and putting that higher uh, would elicit screams. Our business profits tax, I believe, is the second highest corporate income tax in the nation. We've kind of gone as far as we can go with the existing taxes if we're thinking about pushing them up. Um, and yet, if we stick with what we've done since 2002, which is no new taxes of any type and no tax increases of any type, we can see where we're headed because we can already see it in the data over the last 13 years. The gap will continue to grow and the pain in the state budget and underneath our wheels will continue to grow. And I think, as I've said before, we do have to think about a restructuring of how we tax in New Hampshire because trying to do it on the property tax alone is get, it's getting worse and worse every year. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions you might have, but before I do, I did want to say that this is a presentation that Grand State Priorities is willing to make in other places, and so if you can think of other audiences that should hear this message, then we're happy to take it on the road. Uh, I am going to try and uh, find a way to put this into narrative with charts without making it uh, bigger than two full sheets of newspaper. Um, and I haven't figured that out yet, but I'm going to find a way to summarize it uh, so that it's understandable uh, and not too wordy and not too full of charts. And the business taxes, I think, are less than a third of state revenue for the general fund and the education fund. And so if business profits grows at twice the level of something else, that's great, but in terms of the overall dollars, it just isn't that big a bump. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that we're dealing with is that the legislature, particularly during the O'Brien years, uh, made a number of little changes in our revenue uh, laws that cumulatively have some significant effect. Uh, for example, a law was passed so that we do not ask trusts to pay the interest and dividends tax. And the argument was, well, the, the interest and dividends will be taxed on someone's personal return, but there are many trusts that accumulate the income. We're not going to tax that income anymore. That's going to have an effect. Um, I believe we increased the deduction for the net operating loss carry forward in the business profits tax. That has an effect. It's not huge, but it's a half a million here and a million there, and uh, there have been some other changes which I can't rattle off the top of my head, but they're there, and so we've been dealing with that. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is, yes, when the economy gets better, the business tax revenue goes up, but the business taxes of the whole revenue of the state, state and local, it's about 10%. Yes? What would an income tax do in terms of affecting the overall economy or the overall income for the state. The question was, how would an income tax affect the economy and the income of the state? Um, 
That is, of course, the $64,000 question. And there are many people who say it would be a disaster. And there are other people who would say, well, <coughs> wait a minute. Um, New Hampshire is a high income state, but the highest income states in the nation are all states with income taxes. So if it's so bad for the economy, how come they're actually doing better than we are? Um, Vermont has a lower, or at least recently it had a lower unemployment rate than New Hampshire. Massachusetts has been adding jobs at a much faster rate than New Hampshire since the crash. Um, you know, how do you explain these things if income taxes are bad and the property tax is good? Um, I think the, the answer to that question is that all taxes have an impact. Uh, it's just who's going to be impacted. And shouldn't we have a tax system where everybody's impacted in about the same way instead of uh, leaning heavily on some people and lightly on others? Uh, I, a few years ago, I used my tax program that I use professionally to see what a hypothetical retired couple with a house of average value and I think at the time I said $40,000 worth of income, what would their tax burden be? And I figured it out in 10 states. And New Hampshire by far had the highest tax burden on that hypothetical couple. Much more than Massachusetts, Maine, or Vermont. Much more than Connecticut or New Jersey. Uh, that's just the nature of the things. We tax the elderly, retired homeowners in New Hampshire more heavily than anybody else in the nation. And, and we type tax the zillionaires at the lowest rate in the nation. We are the next best thing to Monaco. <laughs> why is that? Why are we the next best thing to Monaco? No, why, why are we taxing in that fashion? Um, because change is difficult. And I would like to think that there are smart people in government who already know these things that I've been talking about, but they don't want to touch them. And, and I think what we need to do and what we've said in Grand State Priorities over the, over the years is we need to get this information out to more people so that they, every time they see their leaders, will say, what are you going to do about the property tax? What are you going to do about revenue in New Hampshire? so that we're not taxing the elderly out of their homes, we're not asking the grandparents to vote against their grandchildren on the school budget, that we can have a state that works for everybody. Carol. Oh, I'm going to return to the first gentleman's question and ask, is it not the case that your chart aggregates state and local revenues so that that line at the top, um, it doesn't tell the whole story because Cities and towns are even more dependent on the property tax than the state is. So when you aggregate it is, is when you get the real problem. And that's why the business taxes don't look like they contribute it as much as they actually do to the state government. Am I incorrect about that? So, um, Carol was asking, if I aggregate state and local tax revenue together, does it, well, it makes the property looks bad, but it also makes the business taxes look small. Um, and I think what I was trying to say to Locke was that if you look at all of our revenue, property taxes are 10%. So you have a great year in business taxes, it doesn't have that much impact because it's only 10% when you start. Uh, but even in state revenues, it's I think a little less than a third. Right. So even at just looking at state revenues, you have a great business tax year, Percentage-wise, it doesn't move the needle that much. Yes, Richard. Uh, Mark, my constituents say to me, well, I'm paying a lot of money in property tax. If you put in a broad-based tax, whether it's a sales tax or income tax, I'm still going to have to pay a lot of money, as much on property tax, and you just can't <laughs> add another tax on to me. And then I stop from it. What am I going to say now? What would you say to that person that I'm dealing with? I, the question is, put in a new tax, won't make any difference to my property tax. Uh, there are two answers, a general one and a specific one. The general answer is, every other state has some other tax, and every other state has lower property taxes than we do, except for New Jersey and Connecticut, depending on the year. The second answer is, 
we can learn from the other 49 states, see what they do right, see what they do wrong. And I would invite everybody to take a look at Delaware, where they don't have a sales tax, they do have an income tax, and property taxes are about one-third what they are here. And if you look not just at an elderly homeowning couple, but a middle-class, median-income couple in an average home, they pay far less in tax overall, property tax, income tax, cigarette tax, whatever, than we pay in New Hampshire for that same middle-class, two-earning family. Uh, let me get to somebody else who hasn't asked a question. I have a question about when you showed the um, one before with the, um, yes, the 8.3%, the lowest 20%. Could you explain that to me? That means absolutely nothing to me. Ah, so the 20% the of the population right, that. that has the lowest they, income, yeah. They are paying 8.3% of right. their income in state and local tax. Right. And so you say, what are they paying tax on? Well, right. they're, they're paying cigarette tax, beer tax, gas tax, restaurant tax at McDonald's, um, telephone tax. 1% are paying the same. Yeah, and so the, the top 1% goes to McDonald's twice as much as the poor people. So they're paying twice as much restaurant tax, but they have 100 times the income. And so oh, it doesn't so come out right. proportionally. Uh, all right. I'm and. And maybe, you know, maybe they drink more beer or smoke more cigarettes, but again, it's not proportional. Uh, the property tax is the big factor in all of this. Okay. And, and the way I explain it to people is this, that in New Hampshire, we have a lot of people who live in a modest three-bedroom home, and they're paying 10, 15, 20% of their income in property tax. Most of those people are retired, and they're down here in the, in the lower tier. And, and these are people living in a nice $200,000 house. And then we have some people in New Hampshire who, instead of having a $30,000 retired income, they have a $300,000 income. And they live in a really nice $600,000 house. The second group has 10 times the income as the first bunch of people. They only have three times the house. So they pay three times the tax. They don't pay 10 times the tax. And that's why the chart ends up the way it does. Yes. A question and a comment. Um, I guess the comment would be: Is your your presentation when it's constantly loaded? And, I, and I'm not a fan of O'Brien, but we have, we voted against him. In. We also that was timed, and I'd like to know a little bit more in terms of the depth with regards to the economy going south at the same time. So there was such constraints that we had a Democratic governor who had to sign off on these things. Now, he could have played, you know, he, he hedged his bets when he could. But to, do, we, do we hinder this conversation when you constantly bash the other side? So it's more of a, you know, I would think about it and respond to it. The more specific question is, is it fair to say from what you're, what you're saying that any tax that's brought in is going to be regressive on the lower portion of the income earners because of what you just described. Because you know, you know, you, anything, anything where they're paying something. So if they're going to play the lottery, which you know, I'd love to see the statistics on who plays the lottery and how regressive that is. But I mean, isn't that some of the argument here that a broad-based tax, like an income tax, would be not so regressive, whereas all these other taxes, where they're tweaking something and moving something. Most of them are pretty aggressive. Let me, I think there are three questions, and so I think I have three answers. Uh, the first, as far as uh, Mr. O'Brien is concerned, I was trying to be descriptive rather than bashing. I may not have succeeded. Uh, it's just a fact that during his two years, there were big cuts in the budget, and, and it had a big impact on uh, services in New Hampshire. Um, your second point had to do with, well, maybe it was just the Great Recession and, and I think if you look at this chart, and you look at, well, you look at 2008, and you see revenue going down, but then it doesn't really recover, adjusted for inflation, even though the economy of the state has been growing. Uh, and that's part of the problem we have, because of that structural deficit. Even when the economy is growing, and actually, let me go, there we go, the income of the state is growing, and the revenue is not. <laughs> Um, that is our problem. Um, 
And then your third question was, well, wouldn't any new tax just exacerbate or contribute to this? Um, and there's no question that an income tax, even a flat rate income tax, which our Constitution requires, could be structured with exemptions, substantial exemptions for individuals, could be a progressive tax. And so it would have a huge impact on this chart. Yes. More of a comment than a question, uh, but I, I would like to hear a little bit more about how we are starving our state of job creation by a lack of a fair way to raise revenue. Uh, I'm thinking about several people I know who work in the construction industry. Um, you know, I know they're building private schools, they're building hospital additions, maybe prisons, but I'd like to see people building schools. Um, so I would just, you know, be curious to hear a little bit more about the job creation potential for raising adequate revenue in our state. There's no question that if we spent more money on infrastructure, we would create jobs in those areas, and then there would be the spin-offs, uh, because if transportation is improved, uh, then businesses are willing to locate in places where otherwise they might not. It, you really realize at this time of year that um, if you've got a product to move out of New Hampshire, you don't want to locate in, I don't know, Bristol or Antrim or Francistown or what, what have you, because the roadbeds were built in the 20s and 30s. And it's a terrible way to move your product this time of year. And it lasts for two months. You know, I mean, the frost eve started at the end of January this year, and, and maybe they'll be out in a couple weeks. So um, that's the difficulty we have. And, and if you look at the history of, of road building in New Hampshire, um, the 20s and the 30s was a time when we built a ton of roads and, and put a lot of resources into it. And of course, it had a huge impact on the economy. Um, we're not making anywhere near the effort that we were making in the 20s and 30s on that infrastructure. Yes? I think this would be an excellent presentation to the New Hampshire Realtors. I don't know if you've considered that before. Um, I'd like you to comment on how this is impacting uh, real estate in general, uh, selling and buying, uh, specifically buying, I guess, of, or because it's both ways, really, of new and old homes. Um, when you see the home and then you realize what the, the real estate tax is. Um, I, for one, live in, in a house, a very old house. I've lived there for over 30 years. I would love to live in a smaller home, but every time I look at a smaller home in the same area, the taxes are so much higher because I've stayed in the same place, so I haven't been, they haven't gone up as much. But when you have the buying and selling each time they, they keep uh, going up and up. So I'm better off staying in a big old house that's bigger than I need financially than looking at a smaller home. It's crazy. If the Board of Realtors would like me to come make a presentation, I'd be happy I'm to come. I'm a realtor. But well, <laughs> If we, oh, maybe I'll call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I think what realtors would tell you is the property tax is a huge impediment when they're trying to sell homes. That I have heard people say now that in many cases their property tax per month is more than their mortgage payment, their principal and interest payment. Um, down in our area, in the Peterborough area, uh, a lot of people who are buying sort of your standard three bedroom two and a half bath, two car garage house, they're looking at a tax bill close to $8,000. And if you're a young family, I mean, that's a huge amount of money to be paying in property tax. And it's obviously a problem. Um, it's hard to get young people to come here to work. And I just wanted to add, my property tax when I first moved there, about 70, 75% was going to the regional school district. Now it's down to only about 60%. But nevertheless, that shows you. I mean, that is where we don't have trash pickup. We don't have the, some of the basic things, but it's going to the schools, which we all, you know, need to support. Yes. Comments on the real estate issue 
uh, nationally, the lower price houses are selling much more, less well than the over million dollar houses, which is a twofold issue that, you know, they, the tax just isn't that big a deal to a person who makes several million dollars a year, doesn't get particularly hurt by a $25,000 tax. It's just nothing. The other part is that as we recover from the recession, fewer people are moving out of rentals after they have been foreclosed on than you'd expect based on the labor market recovery. In other words, they're attempting to shift their tax burden to the real estate owner, which of course in one sense is futile, but in another sense it may not be because in another study I did, if you just perceive inner cities as being perceptually, not necessarily really, but perceptually more corrupt than country folk, and that is a perception, and it may or may not be real, but I showed that inner cities typically give much more in the way of tax breaks on property than do rural areas. And so if you go to Louisiana or New Orleans, for example, you'll find that about 60% of the real estate is not taxed, particularly business. Forget it if you have a house. <laughs> but if you have a business, you probably are not going, you're going to be a friend of the governor or a friend of the mayor, and you're not going to pay tax. And as you move out of that perceptually very corrupt area into a less corrupt perceptually, area, you'll find that that percentage drops significantly. Well, one thing I didn't know in my research is that the city of Boston has a homestead exemption. And I've forgotten the dollar amount, but it's, I think, close to $100,000. And it means that if you have a $300,000 house in Boston, you pay far less in property tax than you would on a $300,000 house almost anywhere in New Hampshire. David. Mark, when you're developing this charter, when ITEP is, um, how do they figure, if you're trying to do apples and apples, how do they figure rental, the, um, the way in which the property tax affects renters? I would invite you to read on their website. They've, they've got a lot there about the statistical analysis they did, and they spend years on this, and I don't know all of the... Okay census data they go through and other data they go through. But it's a big, big undertaking. Sure is. Yes. You mentioned uh, the environmental protection as one of the three. And I didn't give you a chart. No. And I apologize. Oh, okay. um, again, it was difficult to work on dollars with environmental protection because there's a lot of federal money, particularly that came in for Superfund spending. And so the dollars spent have bounced around even though the state contribution towards environmental protection has been declining. Uh, but the one thing I could find that was interesting, and I probably should have charted it, is uh, the number of employees in the Department of Environmental Services. And since 2003, it has, been, it has declined by almost 25%. So we have a lot fewer people out there protecting our environment than we had 12 years ago. Thank you. Uh, I was a New Hampshire resident, but I understand that at some point there was a bill that was passed by both the House and the Senate that was more progressive. Um, the Hager Bulow? Oh. Yes. Now, how did that work? I mean, it was uh, some kind of reform. Unfortunately, uh, the governor apparently just pocket vetoed it. It was a 4% income tax for education. There was a statewide property tax. Uh, and now the tax rate has escaped my mind. I think it was $8.25. But there was a homestead exemption. So homeowners didn't pay it. The idea being that homeowners paid the income tax. They didn't pay the property tax. And, and uh, out-of-state homeowners, second homeowners, would pay the property tax. They don't pay the income tax because they don't live here. Uh, and the effect of that was to cut residential property taxes approximately 50%. And it would have definitely flattened out this chart. Could that be revived? Of course it could, <laughs> if, if people were willing to act on 
you know, the evidence that's before us. Anybody else? One more question in the back. This may be a question for a side conversation, but I just don't understand it. How or why do you have to do the adjustment for inflation? Is there a simple way to answer that? Um, why adjust for inflation? Um, because if you don't take, if you just do raw dollars, it looks like everything's going up, everything's coming up roses. Yeah, our revenue's going up every year. But if you adjust for inflation, you realize, well, our revenue went up 2%, but costs went up 4%. What good is that? We fell behind by 2%. So adjusting for inflation um, makes the data much clearer. If you will, um, we have three different variables if I don't adjust for inflation. We have the population growing, we have inflation, and then we just have the revenue changing. Uh, and so by taking on inflation, then I only have two variables, population growth and, and then how the revenue is moving. And I suppose I could, I could um, show you the three variables, but then I'd have to go to 3D. And I didn't want to do that, so I can do 2D if I only have two variables. Yes? Um, I find the charts uh, very succinct and helpful. Is it possible to get this presentation online? Is it available? It is not available online yet. I am working, as I said, on to figure out how to write a relatively short narrative with the charts interspersed so that people can follow it through and without getting overwhelmed or bored. <laughs> yes? I find the charts really helpful for the problem, but not for the solution. And yeah. I'm kind of looking for, for guidance in how to move forward. And, uh, and I'm going to work on that some more. Um, it's something that I can't figure out myself. I need the people at ITEP to, to help us understand what a different revenue structure, how we could bring in the revenue we're bringing in now in a different way, or how we, can we bring in the revenue we have now plus 5% in a different way, and how would it affect this chart? We know it affect the chart significantly, but it'd be nice to have somebody with the computer power um, and the know-how to, to quantify it for us. So we will work on that. Yes, Herb. Mark, with your permission, this presentation will go on YouTube, and it will also be uploaded to the New Hampshire Coalition for Community Media, which means that every New Hampshire community that's a member of NHCCM can download other presentations that are sent up to that server, and I will be sending this presentation to that server. So if people contact their local cable, I mean local cable, you know, your town cable system and say you need to get this and show it to your community, then in maybe a week or so it'll be there. Okay? Thank you, Herb. Cool. Yes? I was just computing. I moved to New Hampshire four years ago and I have been through this, this is exactly the same, but this thing for 40 years. How do we move off? The charts are better though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Um, about two years ago, a bright young legislator from Hanover, who was running for the legislature, said, I've come to the conclusion that it's time to start talking about the tax structure in New York, I mean in New Hampshire. And I told him, I've been talking about it for 40 years, and he's just discovered it. But how do we go from here to there? I've said this before, we have enough intelligent, active people in New Hampshire to tackle this problem. We don't tackle it because they're not all working on it. And um, I don't know, I guess I would ask you, what would happen if in New Hampshire if the School Board Association and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and the Board of Realtors and, you know, name a few other organizations all said, we need to talk about this. What impact would it have? I think it would have a huge impact. But there are a lot of people who are either running away from the problem 
Or they're saying, look, as long as you fund the thing that I really care about, you know, I'm okay for this budget or th this year or this whatever. Uh, everyone's scrambling for their piece of the pie as it shrinks, and no one is saying, hey, the pie is shrinking, that's why you're all scrambling. Yes, John. It seems that there are obviously organizations that have a vested interest in maintaining a structural deficit. And I think of, for example, expanded gambling, where they're every year um, sort of ready to save the state from this fiscal crisis, which we have avoided so far. But you know, and I don't think that's the only the only thing that, that sort of keeps us invested in in maintaining the status quo. Yes, uh, you're, you're right that the, the gambling people try to position themselves as the savior of the cause of the day. Uh, just in the last two years, we need a casino so we can pave the roads. We need a casino so that we can fund human services. We need a casino so we can uh, do something else. Um, the latest numbers, as I understand it, is they think, optimistically, $100 million from a casino. But when you're raising close to $5 million in revenue, $100 million isn't that much. You know, it's going to fill a few holes. It's not going to lower your property tax one penny. It's an enormous distraction. And it, yeah, well, it, it certainly pays a lot of lobbyists. <laughs> yes. Um, but it isn't, I mean, it isn't another argument that many people will say that it's discipline. It's discipline on the legislature's part because the, the, I think the other argument is made that if we put in a broad based tax, an income tax, will we have the discipline to lower that property tax? Will we have the discipline to pay for the things we need to pay for? Or will we let all the other taxes just continue to rise? Because that's, that's the argument I hear. I'm not going to do this because the legislature doesn't, have, legislature doesn't have the discipline to stay true to what we're trying to tackle. And this has been year after year. I mean, the work that you did with the school issues is that example already. Right? They never had the discipline to actually do what was supposed to be done. Is that fair to say? Um, so I think there's a two-part answer to that. The first part is, because I've heard people say, oh, you put in a new tax. It'll just go higher and higher. And, and my answer has been, in the experience in New Hampshire and every other state I know of, increasing a tax is so difficult politically, it hardly ever happens. So the idea that a new tax would become a runaway tax, I think is completely contrary to the evidence. The, the other part of your question was, well, but the revenue won't go to reduce the property tax, it will go to something else. Uh, and the discussion in the past has been, well, maybe that's an issue, so we should dedicate the, the revenue source to education so that that's the only thing it can be spent on, and it won't be diverted to other purposes. Um, and I guess the third part up to the uh, answer I would give to that is people don't understand where their property tax rate comes from. It isn't set by the town or the city, it's set by the state. And the role of the town and the schools is to pass a budget and to assess all the property. And then the state looks at the budget and subtracts whatever other revenues are expected, and then looks at what you have to tax and figures out what tax rate is necessary given how much real estate you have to raise the number of dollars you need. So, and this happened in, in 1999 when state aid for education went up in a big way. Property taxes went down in a big way because the budget's pretty much held steady and the state revenue went up, so the local property tax revenue had to go down, and the rate went down. People don't understand that that's how it happens. It isn't like the rate's just going to stay, and then people are going to think of ways to spend that money because, oh, gee, the bank account is full. The rate would automatically go down. To Ward. Uh, one area that I would wonder doesn't compensate a little bit um, with the disproportionate tax rate on the 2% of the top of the population of the income is that second homes, which we do have a lot of opportunity for here with our lakes and mountains and all, uh, are taxed also. Are they taxed fairly in proportion to other properties um, of, of people with lesser incomes in that area?
question is whether vacation properties are taxed fairly. Yeah. And I think there's two parts to that answer. I mean, a waterfront property is often the most valuable property in any given town, and it's taxed based on its value. A lot of our waterfront is located in towns with low property tax rates, and so it actually might be more lightly taxed as a whole in New Hampshire than your average middle class home because the waterfront is uh, clustered in Rye and Newcastle and Tufton Borough and Hebron and so forth rather than scattered equally throughout the state. So Claremont doesn't have a whole lot of waterfront it can tax. It's quarter past eight. We've gone a little more than an hour, which I think is plenty of time for a discussion like this. I uh, will still be here uh, for the next 10 or 15 minutes if you want to ask me a question one-on-one. -on -one. I would ask you to think about, is there some group somewhere that needs to hear this message? Because we're willing to take it on the road, and you can help us do that. Thank you for coming.